This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. Good morning. This is Southern Remedy, where the doctor's always in. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And this is the program that you can call in with any type of health care question that you might have. It might be a new diagnosis, a new symptom. Maybe it's a side effect from something or just a general health question. We will try to get those answers to you or point you in the right direction. If you're not able to call, we always welcome emails. You can reach us by email by sending those to remedy at mpbonline.org. Hope everybody's having a great week. A little hotter this week. Probably, Hopefully this will be our last uh, little heat wave. But, uh, you know, during times like this, this has the most potential to cause a lot of damage with people. I was seeing some... Uh, you know, some warnings for uh, Wednesday and Thursday. A lot of the activities that we associate with fall and that we participate in aren't necessarily designed around the hottest of situations. So uh, football games are a good example. So if you're going to a football game, you may not be thinking about 95 plus degree temperatures, but just keep that in mind and uh, hydrate often. Uh, Even though we're almost to October, we're still seeing a lot of those hot, hot, humid temperatures in the south. So just take some precautions. If you want to skip a game here and there until it gets a little cooler, that's okay too, but uh, just take care of yourself. We're going to go to our first caller, who is uh, Rachel from Eupora, I believe. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, doctor. So I've got this burning question for you. At least it's burning in my brain. Sure. And I, and this is not a political question. Uh, what is your take on... Uh, President Biden's statement that the pandemic is over. Uh, do you think it's over? How should we proceed, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I totally understand why you brought up the politics of it, because, you know, one thing about politics is announcements are a big part of part of politics, right? And good and bad announcements, that's a sort of the staple of politicians and what they do is to announce that. Now, sometimes, you know, I'm not a politician. I try to stay out of politics, particularly in the public realm. Um, Try to stay involved, of course, but uh, personally as a citizen. But, um, you know, from the healthcare standpoint of things, there's a number of things that determine whether or not something is a pandemic or not. And a pandemic basically means that you've got a an infectious disease problem or a, a, a health care problem that is affecting the entire globe. And there are many different places around the globe that are being affected all at once. And uh, it's not just sporadic little, you know, um, places that are being affected or even countries. Now, it may be a little bit different, but it, in its you know, totality of it that you look at, that's what a pandemic's definition is. And, you know, there are certain organizations that it's their, their one of their jobs and their job description. They look at this. So the World Health Organization is one. Um, the uh, CDC with the United States is another. And generally speaking, somewhere between January and March, um, officially, that's when, you know, there was a declaration by most healthcare care organizations worldwide and the, the World Health o- uh, Organization that we were in a pandemic, a situation where something was affecting uh, most of the planet in in a way that uh, is a real big health danger, and we've had multiple multiple pandemics over the the decades and and centuries, of course, that affected the, uh, the world in that way. Now, the end of that is when you get to a point for various reasons, and with COVID, there's the vaccination, it's natural immunity that uh, that contributes to this, and sometimes it's mutations in the virus itself. Not all mutations of viruses are beneficial to that virus. Some of them will actually make it harder for it to be transmitted or the illness will be less severe. So all of those things together sort of contribute, hopefully, to 
less of an impact in that. And once you get out of that pandemic phase, then you get into an endemic phase, which means basically it's not affecting the whole world at once, although you may have pockets from time to time of populations of people where you have an outbreak and you might need to focus in within that population, not in a larger population. So I saw the announcement by President Biden that we were out of the pandemic officially by the health organizations that has not been stated yet. Um, and the way it works with uh, the CDC is it's it's on a quarterly basis, basically. So, you know, they reevaluate that. They look at outbreaks. They look at uh, how much it's affecting different populations of people, both here and around the world. And then, um, you know, moving forward, they um, they make those decisions. And it, every every three or four months, that comes up for review. So it, probably the way we're going, we're not quite there yet, but we're probably going to be there by January. So I would say, I mean, regardless of, you know, what the actual uh, statements are by different people, that's where we're going is to an endemic stage. And an endemic, uh, you know, people are like, well, what does that mean? Can, is there a comparison of that? Flu is a good example of an endemic infection. So we have outbreaks of flu uh, that happen every year, and they happen seasonally most of the time, although we've seen differences with travel and with, you know, people getting exposed in different areas to things. Um, but that's that's basically where we're moving towards. So if you look at the organizations that make those decisions, the WHO and the and the CDC and others um, in other countries, we're probably going to be at the point where it's officially declared over sometime between now and January. So uh, as a person, uh, I'm 70 years old and I have underlying health issues. How should my behavior change, if at all? So Yeah, so what I'm telling my patients who would be your age and have the same type of, of overall risk at this point in Mississippi, uh, I would say if you're not vaccinated, I would advocate to get vaccinated unless you have a very good reason not to to be fully boosted. Um, so that's two, two months or more after the last vaccine. Um, right. To, you know, stay away from anybody who's sick. That's just general good advice to give. As far as masking, which tends to be the one that most people have the most discomfort with or are uncomfortable about how to do that, it's honestly the data doesn't support that except in really uh, dense situations that you're in contact with people. And even then, because of the latest variants that came through during the summer, the Omicron variants, they're really, really easy to get, even with masks. Masks do help to prevent that. But it's mainly in those situations where you have everybody together. So if you were going to the grocery store, I think at this point, you could think about not going with a mask and not have to worry too much about that. I would also advocate if you had symptoms that you get tested, uh, not just for COVID. We got flu that's already here right now. We've had a lot of patients in the clinic that have been diagnosed with flu. Um, you know, if you have those symptoms, get tested, know what you're dealing with. If you're at risk and you qualify, certainly there are treatments now for mild to moderate outpatient disease with COVID and those individuals who are more at risk. That's very effective with keeping you out of the hospital. So that would be my advice to you. Now, you know, if you have family that you want to see, I think we're at the point where you could do that. And I think that's important. That is my personal opinion based on the data that's out there and based on what we're seeing. Uh, you know, I, I certainly have seen the effects over the last three years, almost two years, uh, of, of my patients that have been isolated to the point where it's impacted them from a psychological standpoint and a social standpoint. So I think we're at the point where you could comfortably, particularly if you are vaccinated, you do have a little bit extra benefit um, from both uh, uh, getting the virus, but more importantly, how that virus affects you. Um, I have been uh, vaccinated and boosted to the hilt, but I do have family members uh, who have not and are not planning to. Are they more dangerous to be around? So it depends on what the the background of activity is in the community. So I, what I would tell them is, 
hey, I, you know, certainly it would be better if you were vaccinated. But if you're not doing that, um, you know, if you are sick, if you don't mind letting me know before you come over or before I visit you, that's uh-huh. that's my approach with that. Certainly, you know, I hate to dismantle all of the family, uh, you know, with so many different opinions by people on this, on what they should do to protect themselves or, or uh, other people. I, I, you know, number one, I want to stick to the evidence and what I give and my advice to people, but also, you know, I recognize that that's important. It's important to see your family and maybe that means a different venue as it gets a little cooler. Maybe that means a park or a pavilion that's uh-huh. o- more open and that kind of thing. But I wouldn't be scared about hugging them as long as they don't have, you know, uh, the COVID COVID like symptoms. I think that's uh-huh. perfectly fine. Okay. Thank you so much, Doc. All right, Rachel, thank you for calling. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your health care questions. We're going to go to Tim all the way down in Gulfport. Good morning, Tim. Um, good morning, Doc. How you doing? Good. What's your question this morning? So um, I about a year ago, I started a new job. And my old job, I was inside all the time. My new job, I'm outside all the time. And I've been using, like, sunscreen and things like that. But I've started to notice... I'm getting sort of a red splotchiness that's spreading over my cheekbones and forehead. And I'm trying to figure out what it is or what I can do to stop it. (laughs) Yeah, it could be a number of things. Um, So some people with different types of sunblock will develop a either an allergic reaction or a sensitivity to some of the ingredients on there. So that may be one thing that, that, that may be happening. But there are other skin conditions that can uh, sort of pop up, particularly if you're outside. There's actually, uh, you know, rosacea is one that comes to mind that can look sort of like that, like the splotchiness that, uh, that you mentioned um, that can sort of come and go. And it's treated a little bit differently. It's uh, to, you know totally different. There are also some fungal infections of the skin on, that can affect the face, uh, particularly if you're outside a lot or if you're in contact with sunlight. Um, so I would, uh, if you've got, already got a physician to take, it's really hard. You know, I wish we had. We hadn't quite gotten to the point where uh, by radio we can we can give oh, a yeah, good yeah, no, dermatologic no, I, diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, it's probably one of the hardest topics to to try to get to the bottom of. But I, what I would do, uh, since it's on your face and you gave a really good, you know, situational history there of of things, it probably is related to you know, just a a different uh, set of environment that you have. Um, I would try to to use a different sunblock or maybe just wear, you know, a wide brim hat or something like that and just see if that makes a difference. If it does, you've got your answer. You may want to use another uh, type of sunblock. There are some that are less likely to cause those type of reactions. Some of them are zinc oxide based, which tends to be a little bit thicker and it doesn't sort of breathe the way some of these other sunblocks do, but you may just want to experiment with that a little bit. But if it persists, um, I would get somebody to take a look at it. And um, it, you don't have to jump straight to a dermatologist if you've got somebody that, you know, a family medicine physician or internal medicine physician that has some experience with some of the common uh, skin problems and rashes, that's perfectly fine to go to. Uh, but and they may look at it and say, yeah, maybe we need to get you know a dermatologist to look look at it. Sometimes they'll take a little, a, a really a small scraping of the skin um, on the face uh, just to see if it's something like a fungal infection. But once you get to a good dermatologist, most of the time they can just take a glance at it and know what it is without even having to do that. And again, the treatments are varied for all of these different things. Some of them are just topical treatments that you can do uh, to the skin, but it really does depend on what it is. But I would try the sunblock switch first uh, if you're using that on your face. And if you're not using it on your face already, you know, I'd probably just get somebody to look at it. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time and you have a great day. Sure. Thank you, Tim. We do appreciate it. Let's go to Wilma in Memphis, one side of the state to the other and out of the state, actually. Good morning, Wilma. Good morning. I wonder if you could tell me what the normal treatment is for basal cell carcinoma. Sure. Yeah, basal cell carcinoma is one of the skin cancers, okay? So 
skin cancer can scare scare people you know a lot and when you hear that certainly it is one of the the more common ones there they're the of the and there's all kinds of different types but the some of the most common types squamous cell is probably the most common type and it is uh, it, it starts out as sort of a scaliness to the skin. In fact, you can have what's called actinic keratoses, which are sort of scaly parts that can over time develop into that. But it's a slow growing cancer. And then the second one is a basal cell that you mentioned. And basal cell carcinoma usually occur in areas that have more direct sunlight. So it's very common on the face and the hands, uh, the lip. The eyelid, the uh, the nose, um, the cheeks, all those skin uh, skin in those areas can be more susceptible to that. And it usually, in contrast to the to the squamous cell, it's usually sort of a heaped up. It's almost like a hill develops on the skin, and it's a sort of a hard mounding of it. And then, of course, the third one is the one everybody really is concerned about is, is melanoma, but it is a typically a pigmented lesion. It can be a hypopigmented or a sort of a whitish lesion, uh, but it is a lot different. It's more likely to spread, much more invasive. So basal cell it and, and squamous cell, they spread by direct extension, meaning they don't typically break off and travel through the bloodstream or other uh, mechanisms to get somewhere else in the body. They, they just, uh, they move uh, out from where they start. So uh, surgery is the best way to do that. And um, I, in my opinion, either a good plastic surgeon or a good dermatologic surgeon, and there's a dermatologic specialty called Mohs, uh, M-O-H-S, and uh, that's a really good technique where when they, they take out the, the lesion, the basal cell carcinoma, carcinoma by surgery, they look at what's called the margins, okay? So you want to take just a little bit more than what's actually there so you can get clean margins. In other words, there's not any cancer cells at the uh, outside of where you, you took that out. And they can look at that on site while you're there in the operating suite, wherever they do that. And this can be done in an office setting, too. A lot of them have operating suites in their offices. And then if they have clean margins, that's when they'll do the repair. Sometimes they'll have to do a small skin graft to that area. But that's, that's generally speaking, that's the best uh, surgery for that. Now, it does depend on where it is. So if it's on your nose and it involves cartilage, if it you know involves other different underlying on, areas, on my fo- it's on my forehead. Yeah, forehead. Yeah. So that's a common area. Um, but generally speaking, that's that's what they would do. If it's on the forehead, usually unless it's a very big lesion, they can close that. It's just going to depend on the uh, without doing a skin graft, but it's going to depend on how big it is and what those margins look like. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for calling. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, just another plug to uh, protect those those uh, those sun exposed areas, particularly if you are younger. Most of the damage we do to our skin, a lot of it is when we're, you know, we think we can get that nice tan and just lay out there and. Uh, you do some stupid stuff when you're younger. You'll even put accelerators on there like oils and all kinds of things to bake your skin. Uh, but that damage does, over time, uh, put you at risk for skin cancer. So you do want to protect yourself with sunblock. Or uh, you can wear, you know, some things that uh, that uh, cut down on the sunlight, like wide-brim hats are certainly okay. Uh, loose-fitting clothing. There's some great beachwear clothing, particularly if you're like me and you get burned really easily and you don't tan very well. Um, that, uh, you know, has uh, a sunblock component built into it. So a lot of people are like, you know, I just don't like that everything caked up on me. Um, some of these newer clothing, you know, the long sleeve shirts, I can wear them all summer long at the beach with a hundred degree temperatures and they wick sweat so well, they really help to cool you down too. So a fish in those two. Um, so those, those are certainly helpful to uh, decrease the risk of skin cancer because it can be, it could be pretty, um, pretty aggressive. Now, certainly squamous cell and basal cell, they, they if you catch them early, um, and any suspicious skin lesion you certainly want somebody to look at, then those can be treated very pre- pretty easily. 
Um, but the, the you know, melanoma is uh, a little bit different. We do have some treatments for those, but you do have to look at um, distant spread throughout the rest of the body. Uh, Dr. Jimmy, I had a question. Um, I was in my yard uh, this last weekend doing some yard work, and um, I got, I think, exposed to poison ivy, poison oak, one of those things. And it's uh, the traditional, you know, really red uh, and, and very itchy. So my question is, why when we get bug bites or exposure to poison ivy and things, does our skin itch? Yeah, great question. That's uh, Kevin Farrell, our producer. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of different mechanisms that our body sort of reacts to things like that. Now, let's take poison ivy, for instance. So there's an oil on the poison ivy plant and a couple of other plants called arushiol. And arushiol is this oily substance that causes this uh, blistering uh, and the itching that can occur. Well, a lot of that is the way our body fights that off. So it's, you know, that's protective against that plant. That's that plant saying, stay away from me. Do not pull me off that tree. I like to be here. So, you know, that's its way of of telling everybody, uh, an animal or human, that it wants to do that. And um, it that's protective for it. But what our bodies are doing is saying, okay, this reaction that it's causing, we're going to send some cells into that area that are going to help fight that off. So they're almost thinking about that as an infection or a foreign agent that's on the skin. And some of those cells produce substances like histamines. So that's probably a term that you've heard of. You've probably heard of antihistamines, right? So things like Benadryl, Zyrtec, Claritin Allegra, those are all antihistamines because they block that histamine receptor. But histamines are are secreted by tissues, and they're these little bitty hormones that basically do a number of things. They bring more fluid into the area. So that's why you get those little vesicles that popped up, a little fluid-filled little bitty cyst there underneath the skin. They also can cause uh, mast cells to degranulate and, uh, and release more substances and it, that's what actually causes the itching and one component of it. Another one is any kind of stretch or change in tissue. If you think about a cut, it'll do this too. So if you've had a cut on your skin and as it heals, about a week or so after it starts laying down uh, fibrous tissue to fill in that gap to close the skin back together, uh, you'll notice that it may itch. You know, it may, uh, you may want to scratch that. And that's the same type of mechanism. So there, there can be histamine release and other substances like that that cause that itching. Now, we don't know why. What's the, you know, what's the benefit of doing that if you scratch it? Because if you still have oil on your skin, you're going to just uh, spread that somewhere else. Or if you've got a scab there, you might uh, scratch it off. Uh, we don't really know why, but that's sort of a side effect of the body's um, efforts to try to contain that, to try to uh, deal with it as an external infection or, or external substance that's coming into the body. Same thing with insect uh, bites or stings, too. Those ants, they, they can actually bite and sting. So they have formic acid is the substance that they secrete. The genera Hymenoptera, which includes wasp and uh, bees, uh, they have venom in their stingers, of course, that can be injected, and it causes some of the same kind of things to be released in our body. So, again, good for the animals, you know, so that we don't bother them and the plants, but not so good when we get into contact with it or it gets in our skin. So that's sort of the the uh, bird's eye view, 30,000-foot view of, uh, of why do you itch. Always great questions from our producer, Kevin Farrell. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions about any kind of health care issue that you might have. You can always send us an email. We do try to uh, get back to you as soon as we can with those emails and share some of those with our larger audience if that if it's uh, appropriate to do that. So that email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. Let's go to Chris from Savannah. Is that Savannah, Georgia? It's uh, Savannah, Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee. Okay. What's I'm your a, What's your question this morning? I'm a I'm a quadriplegic. I've uh, been in a wheelchair for about thirty years, over thirty years. Um, every, every year I'll get a UTI, and I normally take antibiotics, uh, and it'll clear up, and I'm good to go. Uh, this year uh, I had a UTI, and it uh, didn't go away after the I stopped taking the antibiotics. Um, my primary care physician gave me a prescription 
uh, to, to continue the antibiotics for now until I can see a urologist. It, it took two months to actually get in to see a, a urologist to get an appointment. So I'm literally taking antibiotics every day until then. And if I stop, my urine gets cloudy uh, within a couple days, uh, and I have frequent urination, I, you know, like five or ten mil. I, I barely go at all, uh, and I, I feel like I have to go all the time. I just wonder what uh, what could cause that. Yeah. Do, let me ask you something, Tim. Do you, do you have a, uh, Chris, sorry, do you have a um, indwelling catheter in? No. Okay. No, okay. I uh, intermittently cast. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that, so, you know, urinary tract infections, they can be common for some people with certain conditions, any kind of, of condition where you do have a foreign object or a, a, like a catheter that has to be placed in the bladder to empty it, like you're doing that, that can put you at risk for having that. And that's just because even in under the best situations of, you know, trying to be sterile about it and using a sterile technique, uh, you, there's still the risk of introducing bacteria back up into the bladder itself. So that's the main risk factor that you have. And the fact that, you know, your your bladder is not able to empty out appropriately when you're doing a, an intermittent catheterization. Now, if you had a catheter that was in there all the time, that's more of a risk. Um, so in and out cathing is, is actually a little bit better than a, a catheter that stays in there a long time. Um, with a chronic UTI like this, there's a couple of different reasons why it may not be cleared. Number one, you, those bacteria can develop resistance over time to, um, to antibiotics. So, you know, if it's, a, it's a, a certain antibiotic that worked well in the past, it may not work the longer you take it, inter even intermittently, just because the bacteria that you have in your system are being exposed to that and they can change, mutate, and basically develop some, some resistance to it. And it can also be that uh, something else has changed. So maybe there's something anatomically that's changed that's, you know, making it more likely that you get an infection. Um, uh, so it is, you know, uh, the usual thing is taking the antibiotics like they're prescribed, going through that course. But in your case, once you get to this point, you can, what the urologist is probably going to do is they're going to say, okay, well, we have a couple of options. One is to do suppressive therapy. In other words, you take an antibiotic, and it may not be the one you're taking right now, but it's something that you would take every day, usually at a dose that's less than a treatment dose, and uh, you'd stay on that. Now, there is a risk over time with that resistance to that antibiotic uh, but it does, in most cases, cut down on the, the infections that you have. The other thing is making sure that when you do have an infection, unlike, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of other people who don't have a foreign body going into the bladder like that, uh, a catheter, they may have an infection maybe once or twice a year. And there's actually some good papers on you don't even need to do your analysis if you know what the symptoms are, uh, if, uh, particularly if you're female and that's something that you know you get once a year, then you can treat that with an antibiotic or maybe it's every couple of years. More frequently, though, you would want to get a urine sample under uh, sterile situations so that you can grow out that, ana that uh, bacteria that is causing the infection and test that bacteria against some of the more common uh, antibiotics that uh, would be used to treat it because you don't want to use the wrong one. There may be some that you, you know, that you uh, have to use. Every once in a while, you exhaust all of your outpatient medications that you can take by mouth, and you have to do an inpatient or what's more likely these days is an IV antibiotic course at home. And that's much less common, and we do have some great antibiotics that are used in situations like this for, uh, for multi-resistant organisms. But that's sort of what to expect uh, from the urologist. They may want to do some emptying studies or to look and see, you know, appropriately if your bladder, if there's anything else that's going on with your bladder itself. But usually they would either prescribe that daily dose of an antibiotic that you take for that to help prevent it, or they may want to do a different treatment this time and then follow it up with a urine sample a week or two after you've uh, completed that therapy to see if, you, if you've developed an infection again. Okay, great. Thanks. 
All right, Chris, thank you for calling, and uh, we do appreciate you listening. And uh, that great question, though, and that's a common one. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have to do intermittent uh, in-and-out catheterization of their bladder or if they have an indwelling uh, um, catheter. Younger individuals can have anatomic changes to the way that the bladder empties. So sometimes posterior urethral valves are a problem in uh, younger children who have recurrent urinary tract infections. So that's something, you know, certainly that's one of the reasons why going to the same doctor, particularly if you're, if you're younger like that, because I've, I've seen some patients that they had five or six uh, urinary tract infections over the course of about a year as a younger uh, toddler, and it wasn't uh, thoroughly investigated because they were going from one clinic and then the other clinic just because they could get in that way. It's, sometimes it's better to see that same person so that they can document that. we got lots of different ways to keep up with that now, thankfully, with electronic medical records that are shared amongst different physicians. But that's another reason why you would have frequent UTIs. And basically, it's the bacteria that live in the perineum in that area. E. coli is one of the more common ones. But there are others. Uh, some of the enterococcus uh, and staph sometimes, particularly, again, if you have a catheter that's going in and out uh, of that area. So uh, lots of complexity to that is, as you, you know, if you have some uh, not sort of routine things, most people think, well, can I just get an antibiotic and just treat this UTI? Why is it so complicated? For some people, that's that may be the the case, but knowing exactly which an, which which bacteria you're dealing with and what it's susceptible to in the in the way of antibiotics is the best way to do that because then you can target it with what's going to work and not expose it again to something that's going to be resistant and not have the desired effect. So that's UTIs, um, and they can be a you know, if untreated, they can be deadly. They can spread to other parts of the body. I had a, a recent email from a listener that asked a question about driving. So she was in her, I believe, 80s, and she was asking about, uh, she didn't have any medical problems. She was having no problems driving right now, at least from her own perceptions. And uh, nobody had told her that she was uh, driving uh, unsafe in an unsafe manner. Uh, but just had the question, is there a point or what kind of precaution should you take uh, as you get older with driving? Which was an excellent question um, and one that uh, certainly for yourself and for others to help protect you as we get older, you know, we like to hang on to the things that we used to do, like doing our bills or uh, going to the grocery store, taking care of ourselves, uh, making sure that we can take care of ourselves at our homes. However, um, you know, mobility is a big issue in a lot of those. So one of the preventive things is making sure that everything that you're doing, whether that's driving, whether that's going up and down stairs, whether that's walking across the street, um, all of those things in really taking a really good history. And, uh, and thankfully, Medicare has some great screening questions that they have for an annual visit um, that go through all of those things to help tease out those areas where maybe you either need to remove a barrier that might be unsafe or you might be able to uh, sort of tune up uh, your musculature or your coordination in a way that would better prepare you for that. So that's one area. Another area that's, of course, very important with driving is our sight and our other senses like hearing. So if you have a hearing deficit, certainly getting evaluated for that and hearing aids would be one to keep you safer and yearly eye exams, particularly over the age of 70, to make sure that you're not having uh, a progressive, slow progressive decline in your vision that you may not be aware of. Uh, and other visual changes that might occur, cataracts um, commonly, they can affect us more at night. So we'll see sort of a starburst type uh, uh, phenomenon if you're driving at night. So those are some of the things that I would address with my physician or specialist like an ophthalmologist uh, before, you know, as you're getting older. And if you do have any questions, there are some advanced ways to, uh, you know, test for driver's licensure. Uh, a lot of states, it's a lot more strict and rigid where they'll retest you as you get older or they'll have certain ages. Not so much in the state of Mississippi. Uh, it's pretty easy to uh, 
to get those uh, those licenses uh, renewed. So, But I would check out with your physician first about those kinds of things. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions. And got some great ones today. Always great questions from our listeners. I uh, want to encourage you, if you would like to reach out to us, you can email us. That email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. Let's go to Caroline from Tuscaloosa, I believe. Is it Carolyn or Caroline? Caroline. All right. There we go. You are on the air with Dr. Jimmy. What's your question this morning? I am covered with basal cell years. So I've had a lot of Mohs um, surgeries. The question is, my dermatologist in Tuscaloosa really wants me to be on the external chemotherapy. I tried it once, and I also have psoriatic arthritis, and I found that I just couldn't even function after 10 or 12 days. The fatigue was so extreme, and I couldn't, I didn't understand what it was until I looked it up and realized that you can get fatigue with the chemo. So my question is, how serious is it? He really wants me to do the chemo again, um, and I really don't want to do it because I'm trying to work. I'm retired, but I still need to work. And uh, how serious is it if I don't do the chemo and just treat one you know, issue at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Some, there are some individuals for various reasons that may be more susceptible to getting those, you know, I mentioned earlier, they're usually self they're in one spot. Of course they can come back in the same spot. And after you've gotten one, you're at risk for another one, particularly in those areas that have more skin uh, sun exposure. But in some individuals, and this may be a genetic cause, or it may be another reason, they may be on some uh, another medication like an immunosuppressive medication that's putting them at risk for that. We know that a lot of the medications we use for transplant, for instance, can put you at risk for, for multiple basal cells. Uh, basal cell carcinoma, so or squamous cell too, but basically, um, so chemo might be an option. I would just talk to him about it and say, okay, what? Because he's going to have they're going to have the numbers to give you to say, okay, if you take the chemo, it's going to cut down your risk by what percent? And if it's a large percent, maybe you do want to you know consider that or a different agent if there is one available. And that's not an area I know enough about to tell you right now without reading further. But if it's only you know five ten percent decrease, then maybe that's a maybe that's a, a a good reason to not do it as you stated to just deal with the individual lesions that come up. So um, that's the way I would approach it uh, if it were me, because I get it. I mean, uh, you know, certainly if you're decreasing your risk, and that's probably what they're looking at as a bottom line. But if it's a right. pa- impacting your lifestyle where you can't do the things that you need to do, then right. that's may not be worth it. Well, that's the way I feel, but uh, I'm so accustomed to fighting this that it just seems like no big deal to have them cut out or burned out. Yeah. One time. It's almost like, you know, like you're you're a, a warrior or a knight, and, and you are being equipped to go out and fight a foreign army, okay? And uh-huh. and you, it, the armor, this being the doctor, gives you a sword that you can barely pick up. Right. Uh, it's it may That's be right. very useful if you can get it uh, moving in the right direction, but it's not. You know, it's going to take a lot out of you. So it may not be. Even though it may be a very powerful weapon for you individually, it might not be the best one. Right, and I appreciate that because I just needed a second opinion. He's a great doctor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you know, we sometimes I do the same thing. I'm like, okay, this is going to be very powerful, but the most powerful medication, if a patient can't take it for some reason, and that right. could be multiple reasons, it's ineffective at that point. That's right. That's right. He had to shut me down the last time because I I just couldn't even get out of bed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would be very honest about that and just ask what the numbers are. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for calling, Caroline. We're going to go to Sue from Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. Good morning. How are you? Good. I, I mentioned this on, on another radio show that 
recently about it seems like everybody wants to get the elderly off the roads and up. You know, everybody's concerned about them being on the roads. But what about the alcoholics and the drug addicts that are on the roads night and day? Because old people, when it gets dark, they usually park their cars. They know they can't see well after dark. But the druggies and alcoholics are out on the road 24 hours a day, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, you're right. I totally did that. And I, I hope I didn't come across as saying just because you're getting older that you don't need to drive. Certainly there are some very safe drivers that are driving into their 80s or 90s. Um, and I just, yeah, I was just making a point about just making sure that you do everything to, uh, you know, to continue to do what you need to do. I agree with you totally, though, Sue. There's a lot of other people out there that are not very safe. Actually, if you look at population-wise, at the most risk, it's new drivers, right? So it's younger individuals who not only are they unaccustomed to driving, that they also take a lot of risk and drive fast. And uh, when I was younger, I used to drive a whole lot faster than I do now. Now I'm just trying to save some money on gas. So my kids, uh, you know, they they uh, affectionately say that I'm the Bob Ross of driving these days. So I've just like a you know, tell somebody, hey, it's your lane. It's a happy little lane. You can get in front of me that way. So certainly if you'd have known me in my 20s, uh, that was not the case. <laughs> so hopefully I'm a, a safer driver now. Uh, but, yeah, I think that's a good point, Sue. There's a lot of other people out there. It, no matter what your age, preventive medicine, and that extends to what we do, uh, and driving is one of those things is a, is a good idea. And uh, I think there's uh, knowing your limits, too, is another one. And that's another thing that comes with the wisdom of age, right? So it's if I know that I'm unsafe after dark because I can't see as well, I'm not going to get out there because I'm just going to make that choice in, in oppo- as opposed to somebody who says, I can drive as fast as I want, as long as I want, you know, and um, sleep deprivation is another one. Uh, that's, that's one that, uh, you know, if you're sleepy and you're driving, it is equated with, uh, with, uh, you know, how much you drink, uh, like in the alcohol situation, if you're, you can be impaired from, uh, sleep deprivation in the same kind of way that you can be impaired from taking something like alcohol. And we probably should mention prescription drugs too. So please be aware of that. You know, there are, there are, uh, warnings on medications that your physician may prescribe and they may not have gone over all of those, but your pharmacist certainly can provide that, that there may be some things about operating heavy machinery or, uh, driving while you're taking those medications that can, uh, that can impact that. So I think you're exactly right Sue there's certainly lots of different situations that we can be unsafe we just need to be aware of those and uh, for each individual you might want to uh, try to tune up those areas a little bit so that you're safer for yourself and for others thank you sir yes ma'am and thank you that's all the time we have for today want to thank all of our callers this has been southern remedy dr jimmy with you this morning you can email us send those emails to remedy at mpbonline.org this is an mpb think radio podcast to hear previous shows visit mpbonline.org or download the mpb public radio app to listen on your iphone or android phone on demand